to the house full of guests here in the studio this morning, led by the intrepid Mirdad Key. <laughs> How you doing, Mirdad? Good to see you. Do you, have, do you have a microphone? you got to grab one out of these guys. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, John. It's uh, a pleasure uh, you, being here with you, us. You were on the air with us just the other day. You didn't even know it. <laughs> I didn't know, and thank you very much for uh, sure. using my voice, yeah, I guess. Well, we, we, wanted to, we wanted to cover what was going on at the university uh, earlier this week. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we sent a spy down to the university. Well, she actually attends there, but I told her to take some video of what was going on at the Oval, and I... We picked up some of you chatting a little bit about tuition and mm-hmm. concerns, and there are a bunch of tents out on the Oval. Yeah. So um, why don't you kind of introduce what's going on on that front and maybe give us some of the tenor of your comments. Well, we have Jackson Sapp, Nate Bellano, and Curtis Cheval yeah. who are with us here this so, morning. So thank you both. Both uh, Indeed, this is not uh, you know, a show that I will be participating in. It's going to be a student show today. Okay, all right. And uh, they will introduce themselves. Yeah, get the heck out of here. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. I'm actually on my way. <laughs> so, and uh, I'm the chauffeur today. <laughs> Wonderful. That's but great. Uh, <clears throat> the, the the crux of it, and our student leaders will talk about it. A coalition of students, staff, and faculty has has come together. A few community uh, members as well. Many community members as well. Thank you, Nate. And uh, it is called the Missoula Campus Community Coalition. And it is addressing a set of issues which are coming to us. You have heard about the idea of uh, significant tuition hikes uh, and uh, impending cuts in academic programs. So the coalition came together to uh, sort of discuss the implications of these decisions, but also to talk about alternative ideas that can uh, be brought to the attention of the administration, but also folks in Helena who are also making some of these decisions. We have traveled to Helena. We have talked to some of our state representatives and senators, and uh, we are trying to uh, keep the voice of alternative opinions uh, instead of just cut, 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 and more cuts on the table and in this case, and today, we are really privileged to have three outstanding students with us. And I want to start by asking them to introduce themselves, and then we can go from there. Okay, so Jackson, you're, you're closest to me, so go ahead. What? Yeah, that'll work. Uh, my name's Jackson Sapp. I'm a student of the humanities at the university. I study history and African-American studies, and like all my peers here, and Mayor Dad and all, the co- all of his colleagues as well, a lot of concerns about the university that I deeply love and I'm very oh, he's very tall. very concerned about <laughs> and, and what organ- do, you, do you represent a specific organization uh just uh for the purposes of this interview i'm with the missoula campus community coalition okay all right okay so uh, nate how about you yeah my name is uh, nate Bellano. i am also a student of the humanities um again m c c c c i like how you chose an acronym that sounds like peter eating crickets mm. <laughs> MC- <laughs> great, M- great. MCC Cube or something like that. Okay, so, and uh, we've got Curtis back there. Go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, my name is Curtis Cheval, and I'm a student at the University of Montana as well. Um, my f- majors are history and global linguistic studies, and I'm getting a minor in Southwest and Central Asia as well. Okay, all right. So, so fellas, l- let's talk about what happened at the Oval uh, just the other day. First of all, are the tents still up, or, or is, that, is that all done? The tents are still up as of uh, whatever time it is right now, nine, nine, nine or Nine-ish. It's eight thirty-six. Eight thirty-six. Okay. I don't have right. good good time considerations this early <laughs> in the morning. It's all right. So th- yeah, the tents are still up. We're taking them down today. There were some concerns about weather, but uh, they've been up for two days. We had a really good turnout, and the number has just been steadily increasing since it's about we started. On twenty-two this. or twenty-three tents right now. Yeah, and we started out with just about six. So, so usually with an occupy movement, the idea is to stay there until your demands are met. Did that happen? So the idea of this this part of the movement in particular, because even though it says Occupy the Oval, this isn't necessarily trying to be like the Occupy the Movement in and of itself. Um, our demands were, were listened to, and we have had meetings with the Commissioner of Higher Education and the President of the University, Sheila Stearns. We have voiced our opinions, we've talked to them, and after our rally we held on Tuesday of this week, um, President Stearns came down and talked to us for a couple hours about the issues at this university and sat down and listened to us about what we're asking for, which is egalitarian distribution of cuts and um, a maximum tuition raise of 5%. One of the purposes of this 
particular demonstration was to remind the administration that we are students and not commodities. Because one of the issues that we feel is often left out of budget discussions is the fact that these are actual people's lives that they're dealing with here and their futures. And so we were trying to show them that. And I think we have done that very successfully. So there, there's this sense that I'm getting from talking to the legislature that there are going to be some cuts. The money that's thrown yeah. over the wall to the Montana University system will be slightly less, apparently, than the last biennium. Um, and when you talk with the, the regents, they say, well, we've got to decide if it's going to come out of tuition or if it's going to come out of services or, or whatever, overhead, whatever. And um, when you talk about, you know, an equitable distribution of, of cuts, um, where do you feel that should lie? I mean, how would you slice the apple? Well, I'm not a legislature, a legislator myself. I don't know the ins and outs of the Montana budget. What I do know, though, is that cutting the university not only damages the lives of the professors that you cut, of the students who have to, or pardon me, not slashing the budget, but hiking the tuition, um, not only damages the lives of the folks that can't afford it as well anymore, and not only prohibits some people from attending the university at all, but it also damages the economy here in Missoula. Um, there's something about, for every percentage point that uh, the tuition is raised, we lose, I don't know the exact numbers, but thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in the local economy simply because less people at the university brings less traffic to the local bars, to the local grocery stores, um, et cetera. Yeah, th- th- let me ask you this. Um, as an outsider, I actually attended the University of Montana about 400,000 years ago. Okay. <laughs> it was called the University of the Northwest Passage yeah. Territories, I think. <laughs> anyway, anyway at, the, at that time, there was so much state funding for the university, a student could go to college, room and board, for like less than $200 right. a month. Okay? And so because, because there was just so much funding. Now things have changed. Mm-hmm. However, I understand that in the last decade, the uh, Board of Regents and the legislature have worked really hard to freeze tuition. And now that time is coming to an end because of the, uh, of the reduction in natural resource funding that ordinarily would go into the budget. Well, it's not there. It's been reduced. And so everybody's going to kind of have to feel the pinch here, not just you, but also the Department of Transportation, uh, Health and Human Services, all, all the state agencies of which you are one, okay, are, are going to have to suffer. So uh, when it comes to that, now you had your hand up just a second ago, Curtis. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say on the um, topic of state funding for the university and your experience at the university as, as well compared to ours is um, in the 60s and 70s, the state used to support far more of the university and take on a larger portion of the university's funding. It was nearer 70 to 80 percent and then 30 percent or 20 to 30 percent would come from the students. But right now it's sitting at about 60, 40, um, where students pay for about 60 percent of the university's funding and the state pays for about 40 percent of the university's funding. And so what the Board of Regents is trying to move that number closer to 50-50 because it puts such a, an economic burden on students and ma- maintains a system where education is harder and harder to get and more and more expensive. And so, yeah, Jackson. Well, we're, we're up against a break. So, so sorry, I'm the, I'm the commercial sheriff. So <laughs> we're going to take a quick break here. We also have four lines open. If you want to visit with Jackson Sapp, Nate Bellano, and Curtis Chabal, give us a call, 721-1290. Or 1 800 568 5309. You can also make your comments on our Facebook page, and we will be right back. You've driven by it a thousand times on South Avenue. Now it's time to stop in and experience the most authentic Mexican cuisine in. Yes, we're not going to have any music. All right, 721 1290 is our number. 1 800 568 5309. I heard crickets yet again. Yeah, there you go. Buddy Holly of the crickets. All right, let, let's get to the phone and say good morning to John. John, you're on with our guests, Jackson, Nate, and Curtis. Hi. Hi there. So, the big thing I was called in about, you know, just because I've experienced these issues was revolving around student retention. Um, just from my experience, as well as my wife here in the last three to five years, we've experienced the fact that they treat students more like, you know, they're a condiment that goes with them who's the big hot dog versus, you know, like a business would of treating their students like, you know, they're someone to be appreciated and they want them there. You know, we were basically, you know, whenever we had issues, you were just kind of thrown under the bus of, oh, well, it doesn't matter. So that's kind of what I was wondering how that, if they, if they, they were addressing that or if they were kind of ever brought that up. To well, them well since you brought that up, ex- explain how it behaves like a big hot dog because I want to hear more about that. <laughs> I mean, just like, how did you feel treated in a, in a way that made you feel like you were there to serve them? 
So what, one example was, um, like with me, for example, um, I, I worked and go to, I went to school. Um, basically, when I came to attending my classes, there was a couple of them where, you know, I, I did beer, beer merchandising. Well, every now and then my shift would change, so I might miss a day or two of school here and there. Well, because I was working, the and professors basically said, well, that's your problem for the stuff you missed in class. You know, you can't make that up. Well, I'm sorry. I have to work for a living so to be able to, you know, survive. And on the same side of my wife, um, with her, one of the issues she actually ran into, um, she was, thankfully it was a, she was only taking two classes that semester, um, but she actually had two deaths in her family. First it was her aunt, and then it was actually her grandfather. Um, so she ended up, between those two, she, before she even, because it was one and then the other, and the funerals were five days apart, well, before she even left, she got talked with her counselor and all that, and they said, oh, well, you know, that's not a problem. What we can do is a retroactive dismissal from the classes. You know, it won't be a problem. This won't count against your GPA. You know, you, you, know, you still won't get the, fu- the funding. will still be gone as far as that goes, but at least it won't affect your GPA. Well, she, so she goes to the funeral for both of them, so which took about two and a half weeks between everything, and she went out there and saw her family and all that. Well, when she comes back and she gets everything and she files all the paperwork, she gets the response of, well, that's not our problem. That's your problem, basically. You know, we feel that those should stay on your grade, on your grade because, you know, that's just the way it is. Well, I'll tell you what. Let, let, let's go ahead and let our guests uh, comment on what you're talking about here. Thanks, thanks for the call. Thank, thanks for the call. So, gentlemen, uh, what do you think? I think it's um, very interesting that you start by saying that you, w- that you felt like you were secondary at the institution and that you would have rather had to, well, you would rather have been liked to have been treated more like an actual customer as someone that they really cared about, as someone you wanted to keep there and wanted to stay there. And that's really interesting to me because part of what the message I've been trying to send throughout this protest is that we are not customers, is that we're students. And even though I think you and I are looking at it from different perspectives, we're really agreeing on the same thing, which is that the institutions that we, which we attend need to have an appreciation for us as individuals, whether or not they view us as customers that they need to care about in order to keep, or whether or not they view us as students and individuals in a society we're trying to build together that we need to make better by allowing education to be accessible. You and I can agree on the same thing, and I would absolutely say, yeah, the institutions can sometimes fail in helping students, and they need to be better about that. But And the issue with the cuts is that when you're cutting individuals like advisors who actually do help and do care, you're going to lose students not because of anything with curriculum or faculty failures, but because they are not treated on a personal level like they actually matter. I was talking to a student who had a similar situation to you, and he only left this university not because of the tuition raise or not because of program cuts, but because the advisor, which he had had for two years, had to leave the university because she got a pink slip. Mm. And that's why he left because he couldn't have that personal relationship with the institution. Okay, Jackson, go ahead. I know you were, you're, you're coming up to the yeah, microphone. Yeah, well, we could just maybe have a discussion about a broader problem based on, on the, the topic that was brought up by John. Uh, a, a failure of the, the university to really work towards retention. It's all these very short-sighted goals that they have. Um, I've had a lot of people come up and talk to me at our campsite. They want to stay here. They love the programs. They love the people. But any tuition raise at all means they can't, they can't come here. So you have students leaving our university and never, never even thinking about coming back. So the university tells us that we need to increase enrollment, and then, like our caller just said, really doesn't work very hard to do that. So from, from an outside perspective, a lot of the discussion on the future cuts is in limbo, right? We, so it's, it's hard for us to identify with your position of what you're actually protesting for, against, or supporting. Um, maybe you could kind of clarify what you'd like. Tell you what, well, hang, hang on to that. We're going to take a quick break, come right back. All four lines are open. We have Jackson, Nate, and Curtis with us this morning. They're students at the University of Montana talking about uh, the, the, looking at their future, looking at the future of their, of their classmates. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, 721 is our number. We'll be right back. Hey, we're back on Talkback, 721-1290 is our number, and Jackson, you were just about to address... Uh, oh, oh, I'm that was sorry. Nate, actually. Go, go ahead. Yeah, I, had, yeah. I, had, I had asked, um, what go exactly do you want, or what mm. specifically do you not want, right. and uh, Nate's going to take that on. So. Yeah, well, there's a kind of a whole cluster of issues, um, things that we're dissatisfied with, like we've mentioned, uh, the attitude of the university towards its students, um, these sort of budget cuts that the university intends to um, impose on the staff and the faculty, 
um, and in, in a, this tuition hike, which is an issue for legislators in Helena. So we, for the purposes of this protest, we've been using the tuition hike as the kind of galvanizing force because it's the most immediate, it's the one that's going to be coming the soonest, and it's the one that could potentially affect us the most. So when it comes to the students and faculty, right, the budget cut is going to come. It's going right. to hit somewhere. Right. Do you have a, what works for you? I mean, take out a building or what? Um, well, the, as far as we understand, the original proposal was to hike it 23%. Right. Um, now they, they come up with like $11 million, right? Right, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, and of course that couldn't fly. You know, a lot of people, if the tuition was raised three and 5%, which is what we're pushing for, right. because we realize that budget is a problem. It has yeah. to be cut to a certain yeah. extent. Yeah. Um, but we wanted to make as much noise as possible, make our voices heard. Because twenty three percent is absolutely unacceptable. Right. I believe they brought it down to like eleven percent in discussions. Um, better, but still not. And the the figure is still very very ephemeral. No idea what it'll be, and we won't really know until the beginning of May. I'm from, glad to believe. From my discussions with the uh, the legislature, it's pretty close to fixed. I spoke with the Senate Majority Leader and the House uh, Appropriations, and they're pretty solid on what they expect to see as a final number for the university mm. system. The, what the difference is, is what the regions decide to do with that number. Yeah, in Overall, terms of the percentage increase to tuition. And I asked, because I was kind of interested, well, what is the decrease? If you look at the same biennium the last two years ago, if you go back and look at what the legislature appropriated to the Montana University system, how much different is this biennium? And it's a difference of not like 15 or 20 percent, but of 0.62 percent. Mm. A 0.62 percent decrease. Which is less than 1 percent. So, so... I guess that begs the question, is if they're still threatening tuition increases and budget cuts, is it simply uh, a deal where they're punishing the University of Montana and then rewarding MSU, or, or what? I, I, I would love to know, you know what that's all about. So, And we have one minute. Go ahead. Okay, so we don't see it as, as an issue of punishing the University of Montana and not punishing MSU. What we see it is as an issue of punishing students and faculty for mistakes that they didn't make. Because even though there's falling enrollment, we shouldn't have to cut programs and, and, and target specific programs through a prioritization process, which implies a hierarchy of programs on the basis of content. We shouldn't have to punish faculty and students for not making mis for mistakes they didn't make and for the mishandling of cases in the past at the university. Something that we are pushing for here is an egalitarian di distribution of cuts so that the financial burden is minimized across the board for every program and every single department. Okay, we've got 30 seconds, and I'm going to ask Mark and Joe, who are waiting on the line very patiently, if you guys will hang in there right after we get done with the break, you guys will be first up. So we'll be right back. Uh, our guests in the studio, Jackson Sapp, Nate Bellano, and Curtis Cheval, and we will continue with uh, Talk Back after the top of the hour news. Welcome back, everybody. Hour number two of Talk Back is brought to you by Selway Armory, Bullseye Wear, First Montana Bank, and Dig It Excavating. Okay, house full of guests. We're talking with the University of Montana students who have been protesting out on the Oval the last couple of days. Jackson Sapp, Nate Bellano, and Curtis Cheval. And we've got all four lines rocking here this morning. You guys are officially rock stars, so... Let's uh, get started. I promise these guys to get them on right away. So, Mark, you're up first. Thanks for ha thanks for holding. What's what's you're on your mind? Either. Go ahead. What's up, guys? Hi, I think you got two problems. And then after I tell you what the, the those problems are, I want to hear what your solutions are going to be to fix those problems. Okay, go for it. Okay, the state legislator and the board of regents. I think they view you. University students as seasonal employees. You know, you're going to be here a few seasons, and then you, leave Montana, right. so they don't have to worry about you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's it's like Doritos will make more. Is that it? <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So what, what's your what's your second one? Is it? Oh, that was that was it. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for the call. All right. Appreciate that. So, gentlemen, uh, any comments? It, it's a, it's a fantastic point. If he's getting at the point, I think he's getting at um, student retention is also a problem for us occupying and trying to get people to care about the issue because people are. Students at the university are technically transients, so we're moving through. But, you know, you got to consider the generations of students coming our way. Do we want to live in a state where we don't have a public institution that can teach the humanities properly? I, I don't really want to, and I plan to be here for a while. So that's all I would say. Okay. All right, let's move along, and let's get uh, Joe on the line. Joe, you're on with our guests, Jackson, Nate, and Curtis. Go ahead. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. I see two problems, too. I see, number one, too much overhead. I would recommend seeing Ivory Towers, the movie. And uh, n- number two is uh, the uh, drop in commodity prices and everything. You know, if you're in Kuwait or if you're in Venezuela, I had uh, my ex-wife worked in the school system in East Glacier, and it was always interesting to me how the teachers at the school in East Glacier and Browning were anti-oil companies, which was the number one property taxpayer in Glacier County, which paid their salaries. So if you want to talk about environmentalism and how that enters into your thinking uh, or the revenue stream, uh, okay. I'd be interested. All right. Thank so, you. So, so, gentlemen, uh, we've got a couple of things there. So uh, what do you think about funding as, as far as uh, basically biting the hand that feeds you? Um, real quick, let me just add something to that call, because right. he was talking about uh, Glacier, but it's actually a statewide issue. When I spoke with Fred Thomas, uh, Senate Majority Leader in the Montana Senate, yeah, two days ago, he told me that uh, a drop in resource uh, taxes basically across the board was affecting the budget in a strong way this year, which was causing um, you know a lot of the tightening that's going on in, in all different realms, including the Montana University system, most likely. So just kind of cross-applying that point to the mm-hmm. state. And, and there's something else, too. That many years ago, uh, the state of Montana, it used to be, uh, say, Frenchtown, back when the mill was open, uh, Frenchtown s- uh, School was one of the best in the state because they had the best of everything because all their tax money stayed there. Then the state changed all that to what they call a revenue sharing. And so all the money went into a pot, and then every school district got an equal right. distribution uh, according to the population of people that they had there. So that particular thing uh, over in eastern Montana where the oil and the gas and all that is, uh, it isn't necessarily as bad as it could have been, but, you know, the, the money is still uh, has been decreasing because of the reducing uh, a reduction in oil wells and gas and that sort of thing. So anyway, go ahead, gentlemen. Yeah, so if I could touch on both of those points, we absolutely agree that there is too much overhead. And part of what we've been talking about throughout this protest is that when cuts are made, because there are going to be cuts made, is that we should look at administrative services for cuts before we look at faculty and students, because that's what the uni- university exists for. And to touch on your second point, which is a drop in commodity prices and professors who rely, and teachers in the school system, which relies on a shared revenue from oil, also being anti-oil. I mean, from a purely, from a purely economic perspective, I absolutely agree. It's great. We need, we need people to support oil. But if you're looking at it from an environmental perspective, and if you're actually looking at the consequences of relying this much on oil... It's devastating for the ecological integrity of the planet, and it's devastating for the ecological integrity of Montana, our, 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 our own state. I think it's very easy to say that we should just m- keep drilling for oil because it's good for income, but it's terrible for our planet, and it's terrible for our society, and All it's right. terrible for the... Let me just jump yeah. in here for a second, Curtis. Uh, yeah. Montana has been known as the treasure state ever since we were founded, okay? And so the, the treasure has been natural resources, wood, timber, uh, oil, gas, gold, silver, coal... I mean, the, the, these are things that made Montana, uh, and, you know, relatively a wealthy state until recently. Then the lumber business died because of, you know, all sorts of the, the, the spotted owl controversy and environmental issues, things like that. Uh, the uh, world has turned, for some reason, turned against coal. And so the coal, that what we have some of the largest coal deposits in the world right here in Montana. Uh, they're ready to be mined, at, at, but, but now... Uh, ports will not ship that coal overseas. So you've got all this treasure, but we can't do anything with it. So uh, naturally, economies go down, people lose their jobs, people lose their livelihoods. And so it, it is a continuum that is going to just keep going as long as the attitude that you have just suggested, Curtis, um, uh, you know, is, is prevalent. There, there's got to be a way for the, all this stuff to work together. And, I mean, it absolutely can work together, and we can work together because I value this state as a treasure state just as much as you do. But when we look at what happens when you actually start taking the treasure and you're not intentionally very careful about how you extract, you get things like a butte. Mm-hmm. Well, that was 100 it, years ago. Even now. Even now, there's still oil spills across this nation. There's over 200 last year in the United States of America. So, yeah, let's use our resources, but let's be very careful about how we do it, and let's ensure that when we're extracting things, when we're using this treasure, we don't damage the very integrity of the state as a whole. I'm absolutely for you that, yeah, this is going to hurt jobs, but we're talking about the literal survival of the environment here and the capacity for people to exist. We have to weigh and measure things, and it's difficult. And I'm not saying I don't have sympathy for individuals who are affected. I really do. What I'm saying is that 
the priority before ensuring that our economy is terrific right now is ensuring that our environment can survive for the next century. Okay. And so, yeah. All right. All right. Well, we're up against a break, so we're going to come back. We have Michelle, Louie, and Deborah, and we have one line open. And we'll be right back with our guests, Jackson, Nate, and Curtis. We'll be right back with more of Talk Back after this. Okay, we are back on Talk Back. 721-1290 is our number. All right, and we've got uh, Michelle, Louie, and Deborah all waiting on the phone this morning, so let's get right to it. Uh, they've been waiting the longest. Uh, Michelle, you're on with our guests. Hi, good morning. Hello, how are you? Good morning. And thanks for the students and the faculty involved in this protest, especially when too many students uh, keep their hide behind Facebook or faculty hide under their desk in their office. So great for you. But uh, I'm a bit concerned there. Um, one has to think beyond contradiction. You cannot have an education like a yo-yo depending on the price of oil or the price of coal. You have to find another way. And remember, there's supposedly there's $100 million surplus coming in the coffer of the state. So there's a lot of manipulation there. And education is the future. The humanity is why, because a lot of jobs are going to be automated, robotized in the next 20, 30 years. So you'll have to invest in the humanities the relationship between being, behavior, past, future, that's the humanity. But here's my question. Given the big-headedness or stubbornness of many legislators, I think which there's a, a big-headedness in Montana I've never met in any other states. They are not going to comply. They are not going to listen to us. Their cuts are coming. Tuition is going to hike. I will ask the students this question. What are, you, what are your f- future goals? What are you going to do? Perhaps you cannot divulge it on, okay. on public, on the radio. All right. What well, are but, you going to do? Because they are not going to say yes. Well, well, Michelle, we'll, we'll go ahead and ask him. Thanks for the call. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, can you turn my mic on? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought your mic was on. That's I apologize. All right. I, I was going to ask Michelle um, if he was going to ask what they're going to do when the tuition hike comes. Mm-hmm. And right. I think that is a great question because it's very likely. I'll, I'll definitely speak to that. We've obviously been out at that campsite since early on Tuesday morning, and we've had more than ample opportunities to speak to students that this is actually going to affect. Uh, A woman came up to me yesterday, just moved to Missoula from Colorado, bringing her her life and her livelihood and her family to our local economy. Uh, She came here for the programs at the University in the Humanities. And when I brought up a number as high as 10% to her of a tuition hike, she very plainly said that I'm not going to be able to afford that. I have a very strict budget. I will have to rescind my application to the university and move back home to Colorado. So it's, it's a very real problem for people if we just increase by as much as 10%. So just so we know what uh, the legislature doesn't get to set the tuition, but they do get to throw the money. Right. And in their conversations with the regents, the, the number that I'm getting as far as an increase is 9.6%, mm. which is really close to the 10%. I mean, that's not far. You know, round up, right? So uh, let's just say 10% for easy math. Mm-hmm. I mean, what does that mean for you, if you guys could give us an example, I don't want you to uh, open your pocketbooks, but just yeah, give I, us a. I mean, I believe it's about a thousand dollars a year or a semester. Well, a year. It, it depends. There's a lot of categories of students, so you've got in-state students who it'll probably be a couple hundred dollars, which is a significant amount in-state, for in-state. It'll be about seven hundred to a thousand dollars, probably. Which, as a student, I can tell you, is a very significant amount of your monthly or semester allowance. Uh, for out-of-state students, it can be as much as probably two to three thousand dollars increases, and if you're working under uh, assistance from Pell grants, that's also under attack right now. And, it's, and part of the issue here is that students are already working hard. There are students at the university struggling to pay off their tuition already with 40, 50, and even 70 hours a week working two jobs. So the issue is not that students are not trying to pay off their debt or trying to be able to afford tuition. It's that already it's too difficult to afford, and so any raise it needs to be mitigated. So when, when we talk about the tuition, though, we're, we're talking in an ecosphere that includes all other universities across America. And... Consistently, Montana, University of Montana, uh, Montana University system, schools come up really well when compared for cost. Absolutely. To all these other institutions. So a lot of people are looking at that at a statewide level. They're saying, look, we are charging less than we can for the services we provide. If we go up a little bit, there's not like there's competition at the low end of the of the uh, fee scale that that's that great. I think we can keep the students we have and make more money as an institution. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you say to that mindset? We so, won't keep the same students. Well, it, that's it's a very well, it's a very here, fair here, point. But, here's my question. Yeah, taking John's point, which you all agreed with, where will you go? I mean, mm-hmm. if 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 the if the price here in Montana is as low as it's going to get. 
any place else you go, University of Washington, uh, Gonzaga, of course, Gonzaga is a private school. I mean, all, all yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's not really a question of where we'll go. It's a question of what we'll do. A student who came by earlier this week to set up one of our tents dropped out of school seven years ago because he couldn't afford tuition. He is intending to go back to school. It's been seven years now. It's not where we're going to go to compete. That's not the issue. The issue is that we're not going to be able to attend college whatsoever. Higher education will just be out of reach. And so when you, when you, when you mention that this is a national issue and Montana ranks very well, we're very happy about that. But it is a national issue, and one of the national issues and one of the national categories is that tuition is already so incredibly high. Even if I mean, it's, it's expensive and it's becoming increasingly out of touch for many, many people, and it's destroying social mobility. And in a free market society, you need to have that social mobility of labor. Let me ask you this. Uh, are, are you guys uh, uh, Bernie Sanders fans when he says things like free college for all students? Is, or, or do you think that's even realistic? Not to get too political, but I, I do believe that higher education should be a human right. I mean, every single, most first world... Higher industri- education should be a human right? Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think the, the same way that we looked at high school education, say, when you were coming up, everyone deserves to go to high school to have right. this education, to be competitive in the free market. Okay. I think for my generation, it's the same thing. It's just been upped one level. If you are not going to undergraduate college, if you're not getting an undergraduate degree, you're left out of many aspects of the workforce, and you're stuck at the bottom ring of, of society, and that's not mm. fair. Fundamentally, okay. On the on the topic of rights, I think that most nations and several nations, especially first world industrialized nations, which the U.S. is, have argued that education is a civil right guaranteed by a society, and we are a civil society, and that is what we're trying to build. Now, I'm not going to talk to Bernie Sanders because I'm, I have my own personal issues with it, with that campaign, and I'm not going to come out for him. But what I am going to say is that we need to maintain the capacity for individuals to get educated if we actually want to have a society that's worth living in. And most other nations already do this, or at least offer better tuition assistance programs. So, Since you have a German last name, uh, let's bring up some of these other systems. We've got systems like Germany where there's a gymnasium system, where there's a strict competition from your earliest ages in going through the school system that weeds out you for your potential. It's not like you can wake up 30 years later and decide, hey, I'm going to be a mathematician because I want to really try this time. You kind of have to be good at it at a young age. Or systems like Japan. I used to teach in Japan. My students went through very rigorous testing to try to get into Tokyo University. Families were crushed when they failed in that testing. There's really high bars to get into the program because of potential in most of these countries. In in, in Montana and, frankly, the United States system, the bar is set fairly low. Access to universities is fairly easy if you have the money. If you have the money. And in a state like Montana where you're charging pretty low compared to everybody else, the money's there. In fact, that's one of the reasons why a lot of my friends from Japan would come over here. (laughs) Well, thank you. You've just gotten to a very excellent point because, yeah, the low tuition is what brings students. And if it goes up anymore, we're not going to have any students coming in. Okay, we're going to come right back. Take a break. Louis and Deborah, I promise you guys are going to be up as soon as we get back. Peter will shut up. Well, we'll we'll be right back after this. Hey, we're back on TalkBack, 721-1290 is the number, and I promise we get to the phone, so let's do that right now. Louie, you've been waiting the longest. Hi, you're on with our guests. Go ahead. Hi, and good morning to everybody, and thank you for having the students from the University of Montana show up. I hope you have more of it. We need to hear from more students of uh, a huge diversity out there. And they are being graded for this performance, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Go ahead. But it's just a pleasure to listen to the uh, students, uh, you know, who are uh, basically young people and uh, be as eloquent and as well-informed as they are. Uh, I I simply wanted to make a couple of comments about a couple of things. Um, You know, you were were talking about the treasure state, and here we are, the the state full of this natural resource and treasure. But the, the funny irony about all that is Montana ranks, I don't know, is it, Third or fourth at the bottom of the. We um, are we are forty ninth in personal income. Forty ninth, thank you, Peter. <laughs> well, that's pretty low. There's a real disconnect there. Treasure state, and we're at the bottom of the heap. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the real concern, though, that I have is the enormous cost of going to school. Now, I was a freshman in 1961, and you know I'll get hate mail if I tell you how much it was to go to school here. It was less than $1,000 a year. Wow. Now, things have changed a lot, but I'm worried about the capacity of the students to be able to shoulder that huge responsibility. In fact, in some cases, devastating uh, responsibility and burden of repaying 
of, of paying these loans and these debts off before they ever get out of school and what it's going to take for them going on down the road in life to be able to satisfy that debt loan. Well, now, Louis, Louis, according to what my visits with the financial aid office, the average debt that a student leaves after four years and getting their degree is about between twenty five and thirty thousand dollars. Is that about right, guys? That's about right to me. Could be more, could be less. Okay, go ahead, Louis. Go ahead. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, you, you know, when I graduated, I had zero debt, and I, you know, I would never have been able to make the kind of money, earn the. The, the kind of wages that these kids are going to have to earn in order to repay that kind of money. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the people who are getting wealthy off of this, because what happens when these uh, kids take out the loans, the interest is, the, you know, the meter is running on interest. And, mm-hmm. and even though there are deferred payments, the interest is always building up. And uh, I'm just wanted to ask the students, what? How do you feel about all this student debt? I know kids are going to go on to post graduation, uh, you know, uh, courses and so forth, and and that twenty five to thirty thousand dollars debt may expand considerably. You bet. And I'm just wondering what the kids, how the kids feel. All right, let's. What do you, what let, do you think about all this debt that let, you're looking at down the road? Let's do that uh, right now. Thanks, thanks, uh, Louis. Go it's ahead. terrifying. I'll tell you what. Right. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, higher education is terribly important and uh, like Jackson was saying earlier absolutely necessary in order to be competitive on an economic level but on a on another level the world that we live in is just so scary and it's so confusing and chaotic and I really feel that a higher education um, perhaps is not necessary but I know in my life it's helped me immensely just understand the world that I live in where things are coming from how things got to be the way they are now and it's going to help me chart a path in the future. But I'm afraid that my path that I could potentially follow is going to be totally stunted and capped by the debt that I have. Let, let me be an official old person and a dad. Okay? <laughs> All right. I, because I am Go both. I am both. Because uh, I have the gray hair to prove it. Um, uh, I have a 30, 33-year-old son, 30-year-old daughter. Son is a CAT scan tech. Uh, daughter is a traveling nurse in London right now. She's an RN. All right. Um, they worked all the way through college. Uh, they uh, uh, have worked, they've retired their college debt within a year and a half because they lived like misers to pay off their debts. They wanted to be debt free, okay? Yeah. Which I, I, I honored that. That was great. So, but they're, they're working in professions that they actually can find a job at. So, I guess I wanted to ask you guys what are you working on? I mean, when, when you're done, what kind of job will you be able to get? I, is that a realistic question or not? It's a realistic question, especially for students who are trying to get degrees and things that are not necessarily entirely marketable in the, okay. in the modern world. All right. But, but look, for me, me, for example, I'm getting history, global linguistic studies, and Southwest and Central Asia, the Middle East. That is incredibly important. But unless I go further and I get a master's degree and then a doctorate at a prestigious university, I probably won't find a job. I can get a job teaching as a high school history teacher, but I don't want that. Okay. I want something more. And it's so competitive now that even getting a bachelor's degree or a major and a minor or even a double major, that is not enough. And so it's not just that we have this debt. What we have is we have this debt on top of the fact that we're probably only going to get minimum wage jobs while working through master's programs. And so even though, yeah, there are people who can live like misers and make it through their debt in a year and a half, that's not everybody. Not everybody has those opportunities. Not everybody can do that. There's a comment on this Facebook page saying that the sunglasses I'm wearing right now, I should not have bought because (laughs) I'm in school and I shouldn't be able to afford them. It's economic policing. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, if I could just get back to what you were saying. it's By all means. I'm not comfortable, and I hate to reveal my bleeding heart too much here, but I am not personally comfortable with the university system that says, if you're not coming here for vocational training, you are not welcome, okay. and we're not going to fund you. If you're coming here to maybe study the humanities, study anything in the soft sciences, any social sciences, you're not welcome, and we're not going to fund you. I'm uncomfortable with that university system. Okay. And on that topic, I mean, like, you need to have people who are going to go and get degrees in things like liberal arts and the humanities. You need to have that. How can you expect to have a free and just society if you cannot question the very nature of freedom, the very nature of justice? How can you expect to live freely in a, in a society that's worth surviving in if you cannot ensure that there's a sense of actual right and wrong? And that's not a quantifiable thing. That's not something you can put a dollar sign on. And so we don't think it's personally right to do that. And yeah, that gives away my position. That's all right. Of course, but... We, that's, why we're, that's why you're here. We want to hear your position. So, so we're, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. We have Deborah and Calvin both want to visit with you. We have two lines open. 721-1290 is our number. We have Jackson, Nate, and Curtis. They'll be with us for another half an hour or so. So, uh, hey, uh, jo- join, the, join the party. We'll be right back.
X721290 is our number. Jackson Sapp, Nate Bellano, and Curtis Cheval, Cheval rather, are joining us here in studio. Uh, let's get back to the phone and say good morning to Deborah. You've been waiting the longest. Hi, Deborah. Hi there. What's up? Um, I, my name's Deborah Slicer, and I teach in the philosophy department. I'm also the graduate director there, and I do agree with students that tuition increases will affect recruitment and enrollment, both hot buttons at the U. Okay. Anyway, I have uh, a related question issue that I'd, I'd love it if you'd comment on. Sure, go ahead. I wonder if you're aware that the university is recruiting scientists who do research on large mammals. The idea is to pad the university budget with NIH money, National Institutes mm. of Health money. Is that the, is that the poor science situation yeah, you're talking about? Yeah, I, I heard yeah. that fell through. It fell through, but they're... Uh, they still have to make that higher, and we don't know who's next in line. Uh, so, yeah, they did try to hire a University of Alabama scientist who crushes pig spines to study, study spinal cord injuries, and she did decline last month, but there may be others in the works. Um, it's flailing universities around the country have tried this strategy to generate funding, it's a desperate move. It's backfired at other universities. We think it conflicts with the university's uh, national environmental reputation and that it could hurt enrollment. And who, I just want to let we, people... Who is, who is we, sorry? Are you speaking on behalf of, like, the philosophy department or...? Several faculty. Yeah, there were 30 faculty who uh, signed a letter of protest that went to the primaries uh, oh. about this hire and that appeared in the, the Missoulian, and we're still on it. Anyway, tonight there's a speaker with the uh, National Lawyers Guild who's going to talk about how and why uh, this is, strategy has failed at other campuses. Her name's Amanda Shemkus. Where, where, where's this going to be? It's Deborah. at the UC, room 331, okay. at 630. Okay. And it's sponsored by the National Lawyers Guild. Anyway, I wonder if you all could comment on this right. uh, this particular strategy Indeed, to no. generate money, money for uh, the university. Okay, great. Thanks, Deborah. So, gentlemen, who wants to jump on that one? Go ahead. Sure, I'll jump on it. Uh, I can't speak in particular to the, the, the pig, cr pig spine crushing issue. I know there was a large group of students on campus, students for animal justice or welfare or something like that, that were talking to it. Maybe you could have them on and talk about that. We, we actually did. We had Swazik Lubahan oh. talked about it, uh, who actually wrote the Missoulian letter and is part of the same group. That uh, Incredibly smart woman. Yeah. yeah. Um, but to the broader issue that I, that I think Deborah brought up, and thank you for calling, Deborah, hiring a faculty, bringing in research money is another excellent way um, to bring in money for our university system. When you fire professors, they leave with all of their grants, they leave with all of their research, they leave with all of their research students. That's a tremendous amount of money that you've lost on faculty. Um, so I, I do definitely support bringing in researchers to the university system? Uh, I don't know the answer to this next question. Maybe a university admin. I know that you listen. And also uh, maybe uh, someone involved in the uh, professor side of things might know the answer. But do you know what the pie looks like when it comes to the amount of money that the university receives from grants and things like that? That's one of those things. Is like specifically. The, the murky budget business I don't know right. about. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, I don't know about specifics. But if I had to uh, lob a guess in there, I would imagine that the hard sciences, um, things, or in like the business school, economics, that sort of thing, would take up a larger chunk of the pie. Um, our departments, the humanities, um, typically gets a lot less funding um, for a myriad of reasons. But I would say the biggest one is just that it's the least marketable. Um, so when you write your grant proposal, somebody who wants to teach Arabic or uh, like medieval Christianity is going to get less money than somebody who wants to teach mac macroeconomics or something like that. If I could just jump in real, here real fast and maybe dispel a, a myth that I think goes around a lot. The hard sciences at our university is also under attack. You have three humanities students in the studio with you today, but I don't want to give the impression that it's just the history and philosophy departments that are scrambling to save their budgets. There was $80 million taken out of the Wilderness Fund. I know the, the pharmacy school has been struggling a lot, um, and the, the forestry school as well, one of our uh, main pillars of academia at our university. So it's, a, it's affecting everybody. No, let me ask you about the forestry school. The Frankie family just uh, came on board and, and had made a mighty gift to the forestry school. So, is, so are they feeling a little bit better now about that, or what? I am not a forester, but I would assume if they just got a mighty gift, they would be feeling very mighty happy. Yeah, yes. yeah. I Unfortunately, mean, not all departments have large benefactors like sure. that. Sure. Yeah, but anyway, that but but that that is something that does happen every now and then. Yeah. Well, thank you to the Frankie family. We yeah. Appreciate that. All right. So uh, let's continue on. Let's get Jeff on the line. Jeff, thank you for holding, sir. You're on TalkBack with our guests. Go ahead. Morning. Um, 
I was a non-traditional student. I crammed my four-year degree in 15 years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's not traditional. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, I was married, had kids, traveled uh, as part of the military. Um, but yet, it was, since it was important to me, I found the time, money, and effort to get the degree. And so um, my question really is, for one, uh, are any of these gentlemen, uh, do they have jobs outside of students? Are they supporting themselves in any way? Um, that sort of effort in terms of, you know, the cost of things go up all over. And unless you actually have a, a, a share in it, uh, have some... Uh, you're, so, so you're asking these fellows if they have skin in the game. That's the word I was looking for. Okay, that's the all right. I was looking for. So let, let, let's ask them. So, gentlemen, uh, if, if that's not being too personal. Uh, um, you... Yeah, sir, I can absolutely reply to that. Last semester, I took 24 credits um, alongside an internship at the Miz Fort Missoula Military Museum here, and I worked 70 hours a week in two jobs. I I'm working. I'm participating. I my skin is in the game. It's not like we're not working and trying to pay off our debt. We're not just full-time students. I don't know hardly any students that don't work, and I know just about just as many students who work two jobs as work one job. I know students who will take any job they can whatsoever and students who are fortunate, fortunate enough to have a job that's somewhere near their profession. Um, yeah, every, I, I know maybe three students who do not who actually get through an entire year without working. The, the older students get, the farther away they are from freshmen, the more they are working and the more time they have to take because they're becoming more independent. They have more expenses. They have more finances to cover. But yeah, every single student is working. And one of the reasons we actually have to end this protest earlier is because we have work and we have lives to get back to so that we can actually afford to live. So yes, we have skin in the game. We're participating and we're working as hard as we can alongside school. Good deal. All right. So let's uh, let, 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 let's take a quick commercial break. We'll come right back. And uh, we do have Candy who's waiting and John's on the line. We have, we'll also have two lines open. We have a bunch of Facebook comments also that we want, we want to get to. So this has been a great discussion so far. We'd love to have your opinion when we come back. I like Oh, yeah. We're, we're back on Talkback. 721-1290 is our number. I'm Peter Christian. John King is over there. Jackson Sapp, Nate B Bolano, and Curtis uh, Cheval. I'll try to I'll get that right. Curtis, by the time we get done with the show, so let let's uh, let's get to the to the back to the phones. Candy, you are on with our guests. Go ahead. Yes, I just wanted I wanted to ask three questions. Are all these students out of state students, and why did they choose the University of Montana for their humanities program? Um, and um, I guess that's it. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks for your question. I appreciate that. So, I can start so off here. Gentlemen, go ahead. I, I am personally an out-of-state student. I come from the East Coast, um, which doesn't have any in-state tuition uh, help or any wooey help either. Um, I came out here because it's a great university, and I think we've touched on this, but it is phenomenally inexpensive as it stands right now, even for someone coming from thousands of miles away. Mm -hmm. Very, very inexpensive. And it, that's something that we hope to keep as, a, mm -hmm. as an attractive quality for our university sure. going forward. I didn't come here personally for the humanities. I fell in love with them as I lived in Montana. Um, but I, I have fallen in love with the programs. So, so for our advertising forward. purposes, what did you originally come here for? I and mean, what was the draw? I mean, besides TalkBacks located here, <laughs> other obvious Well, of course, things. that was the main, the main draw. For <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The, the hope of being an unpaid intern here really, here's, really yeah, burned my fire. Here's that five bucks <laughs> I owe you. <laughs> Some, someday you can be an unpaid, an unpaid employee like right. Peter and I, but right. we'll, we'll, we'll wait for that, that big rainbow in the sky. But, so like, like most students, um, we came, I came out here for one of the most prestigious programs, the Environmental Studies program. I had a little bit of a change of heart, I guess you could say, but I think these uh, programs that we have, forestry, uh, environmental studies, creative writing, uh, the list goes on and on. We have a really tremendous category of courses offered here, and that's what attracts students. And we cannot risk raising tuition or cutting those programs. Hey, at all. Go ahead. Yeah, I come from California originally, um, and I was looking at colleges in state in California, and I was looking down the barrel of not only like thirty thousand dollars a semester, but all of those schools are impacted as well, meaning that they're so full of students that there's waiting lists. The getting into classes is a nightmare. Trying to get housing nearby is a nightmare. Now, let me ask you this. Is is there more help from the state in California? Uh, because I know there's community colleges, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's true. W which are paid for by the state. Yeah, it's true. You know, I'm honestly, I don't know. Since I uh, escaped, okay. I haven't really kept my finger on the pulse of exactly how California runs things. Okay. Um, all I know is that for me personally, I absolutely could not afford school in California. Um, and there's a really great... 
uh, scholarship program called the WUI. It stands for Western Undergraduate Exchange. Um, and it, I believe it, it stretches to many Western states, California, Oregon, Washington, Montana, Hawaii's in there. I think Alaska, Alaska might be, yeah. Um, Maybe which, Idaho? I don't know. Maybe. I yeah, think we might probably. have a different d- agreement with them. <laughs> yeah. But it enables me to get, I th- believe it's like 150% in-state tuition. So the out-of-state tuition is something like 15 k a year, um, 22000 a year. Hey, no one could hear you. He said 22000 off here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, it effectively chops that in half for me, and, and it makes everything way more affordable. Okay. And then our final, you're an in-state student, right? Yeah, I am an in-state student. And so I can't really touch on the same issue, but I chose this university compared to any other in-state university because of the liberal arts and because of humanities in particular. Okay. And, and that's how you can get the glasses, right? That's the extra income you <laughs> save as being an in-state student. <laughs> yeah, All right. All right. Uh, let's go to some Facebook comments. You obviously touched on up to that point, so I'll just go on. Uh, so Josh, uh, Greg says, I graduated from UM in 2008 with $31,000 in student loan debt. Know what I did? I got a full-time job and paid $500 a month or more to get it paid off. It took several years, but I finally did it. That's what a liberal arts degree costs. Do I like it? No, but that's a system we have in America. Uh, Josh says, no tuition increase, protest exclamation mark. <laughs> I'm sure there's a ra- raised fist emoji just waiting to be on there. Um, Greg says, here are some of those admin pay packages at UM, at least what they were in 2013. And he throws out, for example, Provost Perry Brown making around 177000 Irma Russell making around 175000 Robert Duringer making around 158000 He's not with us anymore. There were 31 people at the U making more than 100000 a year back then. I doubt that much has changed since then either. That is a, if I could just speak to that real fast. Someone brought up earlier, I think it was uh, John. Uh, he's, it's a very realistic standpoint. We're all going to have to feel these cuts some way or another. It's going to be a little bit of a tuition raise. It's going to be cut star departments. Everyone's going to feel it. I would give our listeners one wild and crazy guess as to which part of our university is not going to feel these cuts. And it's the $300,000 salaries going to our former president, who was just rehired again as a teacher. Uh, it's the $100,000 uh, salaries. It's the 70000 bonus uh, that people get before they are even on campus working their jobs. Those are the, those are the areas of money that are not being touched by these cuts. Hey, now, now have, you, have you had a chance to visit with those folks and, and talk with the administrators as to why those particular uh, salaries are as high as they are? We've um, met with Sheila Stearns, the interim president, and we've met with the commissioner of higher education, Clay Christian, but we haven't talked to them about that. We were meeting with them to tell them about our protest and okay. what's happening, right. so they don't send them to the police to arrest Well, well I, I have talked to them, and, and here, here, here is, uh, if I could just share this with you, th- th- this is what they've said. Please. Uh, when you go around the country looking at similar uh, universities, say, say University of Wyoming, Colorado, whatever it might be, e- even in just the western states, uh, to get a, a the kind of professor that will give you uh, to attract students and to bring you know people to your university, you are going to have to pay them a pretty good wage. Uh, m- most of these folks make between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars a year just as a professor. Okay, not not nec- not even as a president or as administrator. So to to have them come to Missoula, Montana, to work for one hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, the, the, one of the vice presidents recently got a $70,000 bonus because that's what it took to get a, a person of that training and quality here. Well, here's the other thing, though, and the thing that made the whole Angstrom decision a little, I don't know, short-sighted to many people was you have someone that doesn't have to compete like that. They're not coming from out of state. They're not really part of the competitive marketplace because they grew up here. Okay. They were in, an internal agent. Right. And then we pay them the same as <laughs> Well, that's, well, that's so man, it's like that's mandated, though. I mean, the the the, the, universe, well, the, the University of Montana pr- a president and the MSU president have to make the same amount of money. That is law. That's state law. That that's you know that that's all de- 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 decided up in Helena. Now, if you want to change that, then you need to go through the university system, through the board of regents, and they all need that. to have that law for every other field. It's just so. a stupid law. It seems to me, if you're in radio, you don't charge. Peter, the same that you pr- charge John or you pay John because Peter's better than John. You pay Peter more. You don't pay, you know, a rock star host the same as you do an adequate host. <laughs> it's just, it just makes simple math. I'm still waiting for the rock star host to show up. <laughs> anyway, go, go ahead. Uh, yeah, you're totally right. Uh, the administrators that we have are, uh, I've heard it referred to as budget price administrators. Mm-hmm. You know, they are paid 
uh, under, perhaps in some areas. Uh, other administrators they could make a lot more states, money. Go they could make a else. lot more money. Right. So the the only problem with that position is that is our response to that uh, to our administrators having been paid three hundred thousand dollars is our response to that okay well you know they're making three hundred thousand dollars that's a little lower than it is in other places so we're just going to make the students pay for that does that that doesn't seem like a healthy way to run a university to me. So um, I wanted to touch on this. This is uh, from Brian. Um, we've had a number of shows on University of Montana Pay. Uh, he says, if the actual survival of the environment is the key to paying a higher tuition, um, then a higher tuition should be worth the cost. For example, students are paying for the cost of electric buses that will never be re recouped. Those costs are hidden in the cost of operations and tuition. And John, please bring up the point that I asked yesterday. Okay, so here's the point. Um, in the past, we've had many people on. One of them is Doug Coffin, professor at the University of Montana, you might be uh, familiar with. And he makes the argument that the whole tuition freeze, you remember when that was going on? Um, the tuition freeze, big part of Governor Bullock's first election campaign, things like that, that that tuition freeze actually ended up hurting the University of Montana significantly because it froze the amount that people were paying in tuition at a lower rate than the amount over at MSU, which allowed MSU to jump off over us um, competitively when it came to um, finances. Now, that's his argument. I'm not saying I'm even presenting it correctly, but the argument here does make some, some interesting sense, if that's what he sees it as. It means that the University of Montana is charging students less than it can to make the money that it needs to. Um, I guess I'd hope if you guys could uh, just chat with that. Yeah, and we're not, say we're not saying whatsoever that the university cannot raise tuition at all. That's ridiculous. You need to. It has to happen. What we're saying is that tuition should be raised with an eye for the students that are already here and already dedicated to this university. Tuition should be raised with an eye on low-income students who are already working jobs. Tuition should be raised as little as possible with an eye for those low-income students and for individuals who are part of the state and who are part of this community. We're not saying tuition shouldn't be raised. That's ridiculous. It's got to be raised. So are you, are you asking, I'm just freaking bit interrupting, so are you asking that uh, perhaps people in the administrative side and, and the faculty side should say, I'm willing to take 5% less or 10% less if it will mean no uh, raise in tuition? Or, or would that make a big, as much of a difference you know, to be able to, because how many students are there? There's 13,000 students, uh, and how, how many administrators and professors? There's not um, that many. It's, a, it's down to about, well, uh, I've, I've heard like 9,000. Yeah, 9 11, 6. Um, We've lost a lot of students. Okay. President on the university is probably like 8,500 to 9,500, but there's total 11,600 11, enrolls. And I'm not willing to say that because, once again, this is about an equal and fair distribution of the burden. I'm not going to ask faculty that I have a great deal of respect for who sure. are making hundreds of thousands of dollars to take a pay cut of pay cut for mistakes, once again, they did not make. They've been hard at work teaching students and giving us an education. I'm not willing to say that. What I am willing to say is that administrate the administration faculty and students are in this together, and we need to find a way to decrease the burden as much as possible in an equal and fair way for everyone. So one of my good friends is an administrator. Well, at least that's what we call him when we go to the budget. But <laughs> actually his job is to do paperwork and background work for each student that applies, uh, applications, things like that. And he says what happens when these administration cuts come through is they just gut those lower departments. Mm -hmm. And it ends up being more process work for one individual and more things end up being slipped through the cracks. Um, I don't know. Is that something you, you had mentioned? We had a call earlier that uh, compared the University of Montana to a hot dog, which that was a great <laughs> metaphor. Uh, but that, that seemed to be kind of along the lines of what that individual was pointing out. Do you feel like all of your needs are being met at this time? Or what processes do you think need to be sped up or, or change? And, and let's keep the keep in mind. We have two minutes left in the program, so so uh, go ahead and answer that question, and then we'll get a final from each of you. Yeah, I mean, our needs are being met on a like basic level, but there are many services at the university that folks feel could be better. Um, I know for me personally, I've had a lot of issues with the financial aid office, just in terms of you know all the hoops you have to jump through and all the paperwork and all these things. It takes them a very long time to process things, probably because they're understaffed. Um, I'm making a claim there. I have no evidence to back. But, okay. All right. Um, just things like that. It's like he like he said. The administration um, doesn't run as smoothly when the people at the bottom don't have the manpower to do their jobs, and the people at the top run at the place like a business, and they want to make maximum profit. Okay. So I want I want to I want to give uh, Jackson and Curtis about uh, about uh, 45 seconds each. So I can I can even take less. Go go the, go. The thought I would like to leave your listeners with is that these responses, the tuition increase, the cuts to faculty. These are short-term responses to a very inherently long-term problem. If we allow these to go through 
If we allow the burden to be put on students, if we allow the burden to be put on faculty, the university will continue in its downward spiral, and the community of Missoula will fall. So what's, what's your long-term solution, if, or do you have one? Long-term solution is increasing uh, accessibility to uh, departments that are doing very well. Obviously, I think distributing cuts equally among de- amongst departments will uh, increase the amount of students that are able to come and uh, work within those departments that haven't been targeted. Uh, that would be a long-term cut. I think there just needs to be more creative solutions. Hey, Kurt, Curtis, we got about a minute. Okay, if I could just leave everybody with one thing, I would say that even though we all have different opinions and this is a crisis and we're all coming from different political, social, and economic positions, we are a community together and this is not just an economic issue, this is a moral issue about what we want to do and be as a community and a society and as a state. And what we can all agree on is that our future matters. And however we get there, we have to accept the fact that cooperation is ultimately going to be more beneficial than yelling at the administration or (laughs) yelling at students who are just protesting for the sake of protesting. We can all work together here, but that needs to come from a place where we recognize that this university is about the students before this university is about the administration or a balanced budget. It's about education before it's about economic security. I want to say thanks to Jackson, Nate, and Curtis. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. You did a great job representing your your point of view, and we appreciate you being with us. You're welcome anytime, okay? Wonderful. All right. And tomorrow, John, you're all by yourself. Yeah, we'll be talking about creationism and evolution with geologist Dr. Andrew Snelling. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you. Yeah.